for an entire generation. People have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible, on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. This is the podcast you're looking for. We've been waiting for you. Hi, this is Ian Desher, author of William Shakespeare's Star Wars, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z and Corey Club. This is the podcast you're looking for. We would like to welcome Ian Desher as our special guest. Ian is the author of William Shakespeare's Star Wars, a fantastic book that is a huge bestseller. Ian has agreed to join Corey and me for a cup of coffee, and we are very excited to have him. Inside serves you well. Welcome, Ian. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. It's it's a pleasure to be here. And we talked about this before, but I am I, it's no secret that I'm a teacher of literature and I'm I love Shakespeare. Shakespeare Shakespeare and Mark Twain are my very favorite story of all time that I am George Lucas. So just having you just knowing that this book was coming out, we've been on our website and on our Facebook and Twitter feeds. We've been talking about this book for a while. We've been every time there's been an excerpt released, uh, we've been very excited. What kind of feedback have you gotten so far about the book? Uh, everyone so far has really been very kind about the book. Uh, Star Wars fans seem to really embrace it uh, on the whole, and uh, you know the Shakespeare scholars uh, are you know being generous. I would say. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, there are a handful of people out there saying, well, this is clearly not Shakespeare, which is very true. Uh, this is not Shakespeare. Uh, so, but, but in, in general, everyone has been uh, really wonderful. I've been really just super pleased with the reception it's gotten. Very good. And I was wondering about that, too, because I, I, as how Shakespeare fans are going to tell you, I'm, I'm a huge Shakespeare guy, and I love Star Wars, as I mentioned. I know Corey's a, a huge storyteller, Star Wars guy as well. So I was fascinated seeing how you interwove uh, famous lines from Shakespeare and fit it beautifully into the narrative of A New Hope. And that was really, really cool. So, well done. Oh, thank you so much. First of all, Ian, we'd like to ask you about your history as a writer and uh, kind of how you became uh, started out and how you kind of led you into where you are now. Well, uh, this is my first book, uh, and I actually always thought I would be writing academic books. I didn't expect that I would be doing something something like this. Uh, my, my background, I have a PhD in theology and ethics, uh, and so I thought maybe I'd be writing books on religion or something like that. But about a year ago, actually, I had the idea for this book after watching the Star Wars trilogy with some friends and uh, going down to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival with my family uh, and also reading Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. So I sort of had <laughs> uh, I had all these three things, you know, mashups and Star Wars and Shakespeare swirling around in my own subconscious and uh, the idea came to me, and uh, and really, I I don't take for granted how how long I've been throughout this process because all I you know I I looked up workbooks online, uh, knowing that they had published Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. I emailed one of their editors uh, about the idea, uh, and he sort of said, "Well, it's an interesting idea, and if you actually write something, let me know." Uh, so that was all motivation I really needed to to get writing. Uh, so I sent him the first act a few weeks later. Uh, and pretty quickly after that, he said, "Yeah, I want to do this, and we, well, you know, the next step is to talk to Lucasfilm." So, uh, wow, it, it's really, you know, I, I recognize that this is not the way things are supposed to work uh, when it comes to publishing. Uh, and I have, you know, I have friends who have been working on getting their stuff published for years, and I, I actually, I feel, I feel bad um, because <laughs> I, this really has come so so easily, and I've just been very lucky. Well, it's very, it, and it shows too. It shows, and this is a big undertaking to take on two huge titans in, uh, in storytelling. And it's, I think, it's fascinating to hear how that came up together for you. That's very cool. So, what is it about? I mean, you mentioned uh, your background, and, and I love in uh, in in the book William Shakespeare stars. You mentioned your wife and and how she how she views her Star Wars fandom. It's very similar to how Corey and my wives view our Star Wars fandom, too. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, she's been super supportive throughout this this whole thing, uh, but really could sort of, you know, take or leave Star Wars and, most, <laughs> and, and mostly leave it. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. I understand. Uh, there, there was one, you know, I was sitting and, and writing the manuscripts, uh, you know, one evening, 
it was she was just sitting there watching a, a British murder mystery while I was working on the book. And uh, I was writing the scene uh, with the two guards standing outside the Millennium Falcon and mm-hmm. talking to each other. And I was kind of, honestly, I was kind of sitting there cracking myself up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I said to her, I was like, I was like, I really, I need you to read this. And she read it and she was like, yeah, that's, that's nice. Uh, so, <laughs> so it was, I mean, really, she's been super supportive, but, but you know, it's not like I, it's not like I uh, took away any of her favorite things and mixed them. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, that's, that's very well said. I think our Corey and my wives are the same way. Um, I'm curious too. What is it about Shakespeare that appeals to you? You know, I have uh, loved Shakespeare since I was in the eighth grade. I, I think part of it is that I just love these sort of larger-than-life characters that Shakespeare has, um, the wonderful stories that he has, uh, the way he weaves language so beautifully, uh, you know, where he's he, he will just take a metaphor and extend it beyond, you know, anything the rest of us can sort of imagine. Uh, and... And I, I just love that uh, about him, and um, and so I've been. He's his works have been a passion of mine since uh, you know since eighth grade, and when I when I really started studying him, and then in high school, uh, and then I finished his I finished the complete works just after college. Oh. Sort of, uh, became a goal of mine, you know, one year. I, okay, this is the year that I finished the complete works. But just out of curiosity, what are some of your favorite Shakespeare plays? Uh, I love Hamlet. I know that's sort of stereotypical, but there it is. Well, it's the um, best. It's the best one. Uh, it really is. It's, it's wonderful. Tempest, I love. Uh, the Much Ado About Nothing, you know, I, when I was a sophomore in high school was when uh, Kenneth Branagh's movie version of that came out. And I went to the movie theater like 10 times with my mom that summer, <laughs> uh, seeing, you know, Hot Day with Mom uh, going to see this movie. <laughs> um, have, you seen uh, the new, have you seen the Joss Whedon version of it? No, not yet. And I really want to. Same uh, here. Same here. Yeah. And I know that Dan has read a lot of the book, and I, I, I myself, not, I'm not a big Shakespeare fan, so I'm more of the Star Wars side of things. But uh, I, I can, I'm definitely going to dig into this and, and take a look at it, and because, uh, like you said, it's a, it's a really interesting combination. You said the, uh, it was the, um, it was like Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter mashup type thing. Same author, yeah. Yeah, it was like, I mean, how does how does this jump in your head and think, hey, I'm going to take Shakespeare and, and mash it up with Star Wars? I mean, how does that jump into your head well again it was sort of that mix of events uh but but when i started thinking about it i thought to myself wow this really does make a certain amount of sense because uh star wars has the the story that it tells shares so many themes with uh the stories that shakespeare told you know you've got themes of good and evil you've got these father son uh you know big sort of tragic characters like obi-wan kenobi or darth vader uh, you have provide the humor. Uh, I have C-3PO and R2-D2, Chewbacca to an extent, uh, and things like that. And and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, this really makes so much sense. And and just the fact that, you know, Star Wars is a movie that's a little over two hours long, which is roughly the length of a Shakespearean play, you know. So so I knew that in that sense, the format would work out pretty pretty evenly. So you mentioned uh, the fact that, I mean, I love the fact that it's for an iambic pentameter. I love, of course, their five acts. You have to have five acts when you're talking about Shakespeare, of course. Um, right. What kind of challenges did you face when writing this book? I mean, there's a, there are a lot of obstacles that you had to overcome. Well, the, I think the hardest parts uh, were, were were what were also sort of the most fun, right? Thinking about the those lines in Star Wars that are sort of the most famous or the scenes that are the most famous, you know, whether or not Han Solo or Greedo shot first, right? Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's I love awesome. how you handle that, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's one of those things that you know is going to be like one of the first things people flip to to see how it's how it's done. Uh, and so those were the things where I sort of felt this nervousness about, okay, how, how am I going to do this? Uh, the the Luke's really whiny line about, you know, I was going to go to Tashi Station and pick up some power <laughs> converters. You know, uh, I didn't I didn't like what I had written for that until. I finally, in the last round of proofs before the book went off to the printer, I, I sort of had a, a better idea for, for the way to put that. Uh, so that was one where I felt like I sort of saved myself from myself. Uh, it, worked, it worked great. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, and, and then the other harder parts, I would say, but again, that were also fun, were sort of like, you know, I'd be sort of, you know, going along, you know, feeling like I was working at a good pace and then all of a sudden it's like I'm going to chase the rabbit hole of a soliloquy right now uh, and I'm going to you know try to get into a character's head here 
Uh, and that's, you know, in, in terms of sort of making progress, uh, those are the things that slow me down, but those are also things I love doing, you know, being able to sort of, uh, write something that's not there at all in the movie where you're sort of just imagining, okay, we all sort of have an idea of what Han Solo might be thinking at this moment. Uh, but let's actually flesh it out in, into a soliloquy. I'm glad you brought that up as a Shakespeare guy. I want some of my favorite things and it's besides the humor and taking on these iconic lines and making them part of the story, but still putting Shakespeare in it. That was great. But my favorite stuff is the asides with R2 and, and Darth Vader's soliloquies and getting into those characters in such a way that, and of course, Star Wars fans are very passionate, very opinionated people. So I'm sure that was daunting, but you're able to dip into these characters and their psyche without spoon feeding us. And you and actually, and I've seen Star Wars a lot. I mean, of course, we're, we do a Star Wars podcast. But you actually get me to look at some of these characters in ways I never thought of before. And I think that's the brilliance of Shakespeare and of, and of William Shakespeare's Star Wars. Well, thank you. That, it was really one of the... It was really a gift that was given to me by Lucasfilm, honestly. Uh, when, when I wrote the first draft of the first act, I stayed very close to the original script because I sort of think of George Lucas as somebody who's pretty protective of, of his stuff. Uh, and, and so that was the draft that we sent over to Lucasfilm. And they wrote, uh, they, they wrote back and they said, well, we like the direction this is going, but we'd like to see if you could actually do a little bit more. Go ahead and have some fun with it. Take it outside the bounds. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was once they said that, that then I was free to write the asides, write the soliloquies. I, that's when I had the idea to have R2 actually break into English, that sort of thing. Uh, and that was really, I mean, really just a gift uh, to, to me as a writer for them to allow that to happen. Um, because otherwise, I think it would have been a pretty dry interpretation uh, of, of the movie. I, I, I was When I was reading this, I was thinking, talk about a daunting challenge. I was going to ask you about how because I was involved in this, but you just answered that for me. What were your favorite moments uh, in the book itself? Well, you mentioned the Greedo and Han scene, and, and is there anything else that sticks out in your mind? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of scenes that I that I wrote that just aren't... I mean, other than, aside from soliloquies and things like that, a couple of scenes between characters that just aren't in the mo movie at all. Uh, and I really enjoy doing that, and, and uh, you know, if... If I go on to do the the sequels, which is still uh, unknown at this point, um, but but if I do, I, I I hope I would get to do more of that. It's really fun to to sort of take these characters we love so much and these situations we love so much, uh, and imagine what else was happening uh, behind the scenes or that the movie didn't didn't capture. What what are the the deleted scenes that you can bring out that you know within the book? Uh, and so those were the things I I really look most fondly of when I look at the book. That's very cool. And it, I, I'm, I have to ask again, and you sort of touch on this, but R2-D2, um, I would think some of that would just be a natural because you obviously are, are, are steeped in Star Wars uh, as we all are. Um, how hard was it getting his beeps and boops into iambic pentameter and not feeling like <laughs> you're doing the same thing over and over again? Uh, it wasn't that that bad. That that hard. I, I did give myself sort of a, uh, you know, I have a list on my computer of his approved words. So he has, you know, there are like seven or eight different you know, <laughs> types of beeps and squeaks that I give him. Uh, and, and so it was just sort of a, a matter of saying, well, he talks mostly in beeps. Occasionally a meep is thrown in a squeak for special circumstances, a whistle or a new or something like that. So it was, I mean, it was really fun to, to, to do that. Uh, Chewbacca sort of gets short shrift. He only gets a couple of sounds. Uh, <laughs> but but that's really sort of how it is in the movie, too. You know, R2 has a very sort of expressive repertoire of, of beeps, and, and Chewbacca just has a, a handful of sounds that he makes. Uh, and was there, when you were writing this, did you find yourself borrowing? Uh, were there certain plays of Shakespeare's had more in the back of your mind when you were doing this that you borrowed from? Because I noticed Romeo and Juliet, I, I noticed Hamlet, I noticed, I noticed a lot of them, but what ones did you really rely on? Uh, Hamlet is the one that gets the most sort of direct references to lines from Hamlet. Henry V is sort of the one that, in terms of overall structure, uh, the my book sort of relies most on Henry V. I mean, the presence of a chorus, uh, there are some speeches that, that, especially toward the end, that Luke gives that sort of uh, rely heavily on, on Henry V's speeches uh, yeah. during some of the battles. And um, But then I touch on... Uh, I think, I don't know, I, I don't remember exactly, but it's something like 12 or 13 plays um, 
that uh, that I reference in some way, shape, or form. Um, and and those were just you know I, I sort of tried to throw those in as I could, sort of as naturally as possible. There was one point when uh, you know when I had. Uh, I'm writing the soliloquy for Luke looking out at the double sons of Tatooine. Uh, and I, I almost included the line to go or not to go. That is the question. But I was like, <laughs> like, no, that's, that's too much. That's, that's just a little bit too far right there. Right. I'm glad, I'm gl- I think it worked out well. And it, this is the thing too, where I feel like Star Wars fans and it, some people, one of the big problems I run into when teaching Shakespeare, and this will come as no surprise to either of you is people get intimidated by the language. And that's what I, I was wondering about when I was going to pick up this book. Is it going to be hard for a casual reader to digest? I've heard people on other podcasts saying, boy, this was hard for me to get through, not because it wasn't great, but because I found the language challenging. Now, of course, it's not 100% Shakespearean style because there aren't those allusions to Greek mythology because that really probably wouldn't fit in the Star Wars universe. But how many, how many times did you say, oh, this is probably too much or maybe I need to go further with this how did you maintain that that beautiful balance that you maintain with William Shakespeare's Star Wars well let me briefly say uh, on your comment about Greek mythology you're absolutely right about that I did have one line in there about the something about the Pleiades and Orion yes uh, and and Lucasfilm said nope that that has to go Uh, because you know for the very reason that you mentioned right it's it's something that sort of refers to our galaxy Uh, verisimilitude yeah yeah Yeah. exactly Um, and so uh, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, just by by nature of the fact that 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 I'm not living in the 16th or 17th century, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to be, end up using some of the more difficult vocabulary that Shakespeare used. Um, my hope, and actually, really, really my biggest hope for this book uh, uh, overall, it's sort of a, a secret hope, uh, is that it might be something that is sort of a, a bridge for kids to help help get them into Shakespeare because you're absolutely right Shakespeare is is intimidating and and so my hope is that you know this is sort of it is it is that balance it is sort of an introduction to Shakespeare's language overall because it is an iambic pentameter it is using some of his literary devices and and things like that and certainly making reference to the occasional line from Shakespeare Um, and yet it's the story that they're very familiar with and so even if you are having a little bit of trouble with the language, you know overall sort of where you're going with the story. Um, and so my hope is that this could be something that teachers might use to sort of, uh, you know, let them read some of William Shakespeare's Star Wars to get a feel for what the language is kind of like before you jump into Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet or something like that, uh, where you're sort of all the way in. Because there is this sort of aura around Shakespeare that he's uh, in, inapproachable and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, I just think this is something that maybe could help uh, with that a little bit. Well, it's, it's if, if you'll pardon my pun here, it's going to be a new hope for teachers. <laughs> because <laughs> because um, I, and you and I, you were so kind in, in tweeting back to us and email and back and forth and, and all those great things which helped to lead to this interview. So thank you again for that. But I teach Romeo and Juliet every year. I teach Hamlet every year. In fact, I make all my students memorize to be or not to be. I actually recited it. On my first date uh, with my wife, and she agreed to marry me. I'm, I hopefully she didn't understand I was giving a soliloquy on suicide. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's good. Um, but I am absolutely going to use this when I'm introducing Romeo and Juliet, particularly because freshmen are really get intimidated by Shakespeare. And then, of course, I show the movie with that hunky Leonardo DiCaprio, and then everybody's all happy. But I think it's a really excellent parallel, a bridge. And you're an educator yourself. You have a background in that. And, and I think it's great. I'm really, in fact, I look forward to showing a lot of my colleagues how this is. And you have lesson plans for William Shakespeare Star Wars. You sent them to me. I saw them in the back of the book. Sonnet 1138. Nice. Very nice, by the way. <laughs> T- talk about the lesson plans and how that came about. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I wouldn't call it exactly a lesson plan, but it's an educator's guide that I put together. And basically what it does is it sort of, uh, pulls the curtain back and says, okay, you know, here's some of what's going on, you know, so, so that you can really make sure you're catching everything. Um, so it explains what iambic pentameter is in the first place. Uh, it explains all of the references uh, to Shakespeare that can be found, to, to, to actual lines uh, that can be found within uh, William Shakespeare's Star Wars. Um, it explains some of the literary devices that are used and where, and then shows where you can find those in Shakespeare also. Um, talks a bit just about, about 
the language and 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 you know uh, how Shakespeare can be approached. And and yeah, my, my hope with that is really that it might be something that teachers can use or, or show to their students and say, okay, you know, there there really is a, you know beyond just sort of uh, sounding Shakespearean esque, uh, there there really is some are some parallels here. So that once I mean, I guess the overall point is once you've read William Shakespeare's Star Wars, you have in some way been introduced to to Shakespeare and some of the writing. And I would not claim at all that I'm a Shakespeare, uh, not in the least. Um, but at least you're seeing some of the, you know, you're seeing the rhythm and the meter, some of the lines, some of the devices, that sort of thing. Well, that's much more than the average person, believe me. Um, and it, it's very, I, I'm definitely, I, I'm looking forward to uh, telling you how it goes in my classes when I introduce that. Because I've been trying to teach, I'm a pentameter for a while. I think it's gone well. But the way this breaks down and makes it approachable is something that I strongly suggest educators glom onto. In fact, I know we have a lot of educators that listen to our show, so it's going to be really cool, Ian, to see how that pans out. And I'd love to hear how it goes in the classroom. Well, I'll be honest with you guys. I mean, you guys were talking about some great stuff, and and I first saw this 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 book come out, and I was kind of like, oh, you know, it's kind of just a mashup, a quick grab, but you know, a uh, uh, kind of a goofy uh, way of putting it, and. And as you guys are talking about this, I'm like, you know, this sounds really interesting. <laughs> and and I, I remember reading in high school, I read Macbeth, and I think I was Apparition 3 or something like that. It was just, <laughs> it did, <laughs> I was just not, it was just didn't mesh for me. But like, as you, as you talk about this and you, the way you introduce it as, you know, with Star Wars, like, cause I can follow Star Wars themes and things like that. So now as you say, this may nice nice lead into like some, some Shakespeare stuff. I'm really honestly interested in, in t- picking this up and really get into this. And- well, thanks. And, and I, and, and certainly if people just want to pick it up and enjoy it, I hope that will happen too. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a way into Shakespeare. Um, but, it, but I hope that it can be that also. And again, you, you want, there are some two slippery slopes here and you, and you, you walk them beautifully. And, and so I applaud you for that. This is a, it's a hard thing to do. Uh, Shakespeare, people who are passionate about Shakespeare are very specific about it as they are about Star Wars. So I think you've managed to grab onto two fan bases that don't normally have coffee together like we are right now, if you understand <laughs> my saying. <laughs> yes, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, I think there are plenty of Star Wars fans who appreciate Shakespeare and uh, maybe even more Shakespeare fans who appreciate Star Wars. Um, but, you know, the, the sort of overlap among the super uh engaged on both sides of that or it's probably not huge and and if you and for fans who were thinking well shakespeare i don't know that's intimidating william shakespeare star wars is not intimidating it's a heck of a lot of fun it's extremely well done and you need to go out and buy it because you already know the story as Corey mentioned you understand the characters but you're not going to understand them the way that you will after you read this book it really does give you insights into the characters which is a mark of Shakespeare's brilliance and, and one of the great things that Ian does as well. Well, thank you. Well, Ian, uh, I'm interested. Like you mentioned too that uh, you, you were kind of not sure where this is going to go and and if there'll be sequels or not. But I mean, in the back of your mind, there's obviously some ideas of what where this will go, where this lead will. You know, we're looking at are we looking at Empire and Return of the Jedi and, and the possible prequels or how about that? Uh, I think it would be a lot of fun to do Empire and Return. Um, I. You know, I don't think you do one and not do the other. I, I, I can't imagine that you would do Empire and then not actually do Return. That that wouldn't make any sense. Sure. Um, it's hard for me to imagine the prequels happening, uh, just because they're just relatively speaking, they're they're so much less popular. Um, it's hard for me <laughs> to imagine that there would be an ongoing audience uh, for the prequels as well. Especially, I can't, with, I can't imagine how you do Jar Jar either. Yeah, oh, he'd be. I would love to see how you do Jar Jar. <laughs> I'd have to make him like the smartest sounding character ever. Yes. Totally, totally flip him around. You yes. know, uh, yeah. The the anti Polonius, if you will. Right. Exactly. Um, so I I do I do think there's more to explore here. I think it would be really interesting to answer the questions of you know what does Lando uh, offer soliloquies about? Uh, how does Yoda talk in in a universe where oh, yeah. people are. People already sound a little bit like Yoda uh, because of the word order in Shakespeare. You know, uh, how, how does Yoda end up sounding in this context? Um, so, I think there could be and and the, the whole you know Luke finding out that he's Darth Vader's son just so rich uh, in terms of Shakespearean possibilities. There, we'll see. We'll see. I would love to do them. The uh, the Yoda thing. I thought about that when I was reading this too about how 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 would Yoda sound? Is that that's pretty cool. Um, I hope, and this is just my own selfish desire, uh, when I became a teacher, Revenge of the Sith came out, and 
I, when I introduced Shakespeare, I talked all the time about Anakin's fall and how he, he meets the perfect Shakespearean criteria of a tragic hero. So I hope, I mean, of course, I want you to do Empire and Jedi, but I really hope that they give you a chance to do Revenge of the Sith because I think that one, maybe as well as A New Hope, hits all the Shakespearean uh, archetypes and notes of, of, a, of a narrative. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and, and I always say that, you know, when it comes to the prequels, I feel like they did get better and better. Uh, and Re- and no. Revenge of the Sith is, I think, the best one of the of the three. No question. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and that's really interesting uh, to to sort of think about how uh, how you would sort of capture that because I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Anakin Skywalker, and really, when you take the all six movies as sort of a one narrative arc, it really is the tragedy of Anakin Skywalker. Um, oh, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. He he fits all the criteria. I mean, you know, the a person of importance in the culture and has a tragic flaw and. Oh yeah, that would. I hope that happens. And, and if it does, feel free to to mention uh, coffee with Kenobi. It may be in your notes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure I do that. <laughs> uh, thank you to Dan Zare for this idea. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm going to play that for my students when they're not reading their stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ian, how, how can people get in touch with you online, as far as your website or possibly Twitter feed or anything like that? Sure. Uh, I'm at iandesher.com. It's I-A-N-D-O-E-S-C-H-E-R.com. Um, and I'm also at Ian Desher on Twitter. Uh, so that's a way people can stay in touch with me. The The book's website officially is quirkbooks.com slash Shakespeare Star Wars. And that's where the educator's guide is uh, and can be downloaded there for free. So before we let you go, Ian, uh, as, as is our tradition here with our guests who have a cup of coffee with us on Coffee with Kenobi, are you doing okay on your coffee? Do you need a refill? Are you doing okay? I think I'm all right. I'm almost done here. Oh, attaboy. <laughs> attaboy. Okay, well, we have five questions that are one word, uh, one sentence replies, and that we ask all of our all of our guests here on Coffee with Kenobi. So we'll, uh, I'll have Corey go ahead and start with the first one. Sure. Uh, your favorite Star Wars movie? Return of the Jedi, and I know that makes me unusual. Oh, wow. You're the first person of all of our guests to say that. I know. Empire is always the winner in that one. But <laughs> yeah. Yep. We don't usually ask why, but I have to ask why you picked Jedi. You, you know, honestly, I have a soft spot in my heart for the whole Jabba the Hutt sequence. And I don't know if it's because when I was a kid, we had the making of Return of the Jedi, like on VHS. Yeah. You know, that I used to watch. Creature, oh, yeah. The creatures thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, that, that I think is, is sort of the, the main reason. Plus, remember when um, when the figures came out uh, for Return of the Jedi, and the, the first ones to come out were like Bib Fortuna and Luke in his black Jedi yeah. gear. That was awesome. Absolutely, and I had Jabba and the whole Jabba band and everything. Yeah, yep. Uh, who is your favorite character? Han Solo. Favorite line of dialogue and or film moment? I think it's got to be "I love you." I know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me why that one. Uh, oh, I mean, it's just quintessential Han, right? Yeah, he's just yeah. too cool for for anything. Uh, and then and then that they turn it back on its head in Return of the Jedi. I mean, that's yeah, it's great. So, if you collect, what is your favorite collectible that you own? So, I don't collect. Uh, sadly, when I was a kid, my favorites were my Millennium Falcon and my Adat. Uh, and my kids now have the Lego Millennium Falcon, which oh, cool! I have to admit, I put together more than they did. <laughs> that's how it goes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what what particular message or themes about Star Wars uh, resonate with you or speak to you? You know, I think uh, it's the whole sort of, especially when I was a kid, the whole good versus evil uh, thing. You know, it's it's comforting when you're a kid to believe that there, you know, are just good characters and there are just bad characters, and the difference between them is very clear. Uh, and and I think that's what really captured my imagination as a kid. Besides, just sort of the fascinating, fun, different characters that uh, the world of Star Wars created. Uh, I think it's overall it's that sort of good versus evil thing. Which now, as an adult, I you know I realize there are far more shades of gray in actual human life. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but I think as a kid, that's really what drew me to the movies. And that's another nice parallel between Shakespeare's world and Star Wars as well. Absolutely. Yep. The villains are the villains, and you know them. That's right. There's a reason Darth Vader wears all black. Yeah, that's right. Of course, then you get into the stormtroopers, and they're all white with a little bit of black. So you could. There's a lot of interesting things you could look at with that. Absolutely. So we want to thank Corey, and I would love to thank Ian Desher for being our special guest to talk about William Shakespeare's Star Wars. If you have not purchased this book yet, you need to go out and buy it. 
It's an excellent book. It's a lot of fun. It opens up, what is it Obi-Wan says? You just, you're just taking your first step into a larger world. So, and that's what this book does for you. So thank you so much, Ian, for being our special guest here on Coffee with Kenobi. Oh, thank you so much, both of you. My Jedi training didn't prepare me for this. Our show topic for show number five is the expanding universe and canon. Are you an expanding universe person? Why or why not? What about canon in general? How important is it? Why is it important? Should it be important? This comes up every single show that we've done so far. And in talking to Trisha and, and other fans who love the expanding universe, I've read a lot more expanded universe stuff since we started doing this podcast. Corey and I talk about it a lot. We're very excited about the Kenobi book. So we need to talk about the expanded universe and its role in the Star Wars universe and fandom. So send us your email suggestions and your comments and your thoughts on this to feedback at coffeewithkenobi.com, and we will discuss them on the next show. I like the sound of that. If you would like to respond to our question of the show, have a comment, or just want to say hello, send us an email at feedback at coffeewithkenobi.com. Or if you have a specific question or comment for either of us individually, email us at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com or Corey C at coffeewithkenobi.com or visit us at coffeewithkenobi.com and click on the comments section. If you enjoy the show, please write a review in iTunes. You can also like the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi as well as keep up to date at our Twitter feed at twitter.com forward slash coffeewithkenobi. If you enjoy the jazz music, download the album Eye to Eye by Steve Torok on iTunes. Give the evacuation code signal. Don't forget to send us your comments and opinions on the topic for show number five, the expanding universe and the importance of canon and the Star Wars universe. This is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited and is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names and sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney or their respective trademarks and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. There's no one here. Move along.